Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you I hope you all can can hear me and see me. Uh, we have a I, I think a, a, an interesting and exciting presentation today, um, and to and to share some things that we think are really important. Sorry, I'm I'm, I'm hearing some echo on. Well, the, the, the title of our presentation today is around, uh, is around sharing our stories um, and giving thanks. And uh, I, I, I don't think it's often that you, um, that you maybe hear big, big companies talking about uh, saying thank you. But uh, I think we have a great, uh, we have a great session today. Um, and I wanted to just go through our, uh, quickly our, our agenda. We're going to do some quick introductions uh, of everyone who will be speaking. Speaking today, um, I think you'll be very impressed with uh, with with those who are uh, who are going to be talking to you. Um, we're going to be um, sharing, you know, just uh, quickly what a clinical trial is, um, and that will set, uh, I, I think, you know, the the direction of the the talk that we're going to have today, because we're going to be talking about personal stories. Um, and uh, we're, um, you know, both uh, Nicole and Liz. Um, were both um, in a clinical trial themselves, and uh, I think you'll find the, find their stories fascinating. Um, we'll be talking about gene therapy uh, with Nicola, and he has some great uh, and fun polling questions for you. And then I'll be coming back to you um, to talk about our um, uh, our giving thoughtful closure program uh, and how we give thanks uh, to our clinical trial. Uh, participants uh, at Pfizer. And then we have a great, um, I think, uh, a great interactive session with you all where we're going to be sharing some designs for our pediatric uh, thank you cards. And we wanted you to vote uh, on, the, on the designs of those cards, um, on which ones you like the most, which ones you like the least. Um, and I think, I think that'll be uh, a lot of fun. Next slide, please. So for introductions, I'll start. Um, uh, my name is David Leventhal, and uh, I work in a group called Clinical Trial Experience at Pfizer. And we, um, uh, the thing that we focus on is uh, how uh, participants and uh, and investigators experience working with Pfizer. What is it like um, to be in one of our clinical trials, to conduct one of our clinical trials? Um, so this is all really important to me. Um, I've been at Pfizer for 24 years, and I have my favorite animal here, which is the sea otter, and that'll be important in a minute. Um, and what you probably can't see, but I'm going to stand up. I'm wearing a T-shirt that says science will win because that's what we believe at Pfizer, and, uh, and uh, we think with everything that's going on in the world today, science is going to be uh, the answer to these really difficult questions. So, Nicole? Hello, can you all hear me okay? Great. So, I've been at Pfizer for 18 years, and... I work on product filings with the FDA and other regulatory bodies so that we can get uh, new drugs approved or make sure that we can keep providing medicines that people already take around the world. And I also work with some of these different um, initiatives around patients. Uh, I do speaking and advocacy work. Um, and my favorite animal is a dolphin. And I think you might be able to see back here. I've got my dolphin picture up. And I also have a picture I painted myself, so don't laugh at it, uh, that has my home state on it, which I live in Michigan. So I wonder if some of you do as well. And I also am wearing a t-shirt today for rare disease. Um, and you'll be hearing a little bit more about that because I have a rare disease. And I absolutely love that you're gonna get to hear a little bit more about our rare disease group today. Nicholas. Thank you, Nicole, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so my name is uh, Nicolas Garnier, and uh, I've been at Pfizer for five years, so kind of the new kid on the block almost uh, on the team. 
Um, I'm responsible for engaging patients and, and being a patient advocate within Pfizer for the uh, rare disease uh, division and focusing on clinical trials. So also very proud to be rocking my uh, a rare disease uh, a t-shirt today. Uh, my favorite animal is the orca well. I like marine animals and, and it's, you know, it's big and strong, it's peaceful, but can also be ruthless. So I kind of like that. And uh, I'll be speaking to you guys today about uh, a topic that is very dear to my heart, which is uh, pediatric gene therapy clinical trials. And, um, you know, I want to thank you guys for, for being on the line today with us. Liz? Thanks, Nicola. And I'm Liz Courtney, the last of our speakers. And I've been with Pfizer for 23 years. I'm currently in our global product development group um, in business operations. And I lead um, strategic initiatives. So I do a lot of work around various aspects of clinical trials and regulatory processes um, to make the, our Pfizer trials and our submissions better, faster, um, and of higher quality for all of our, our key stakeholders. And my favorite animal is a dog. Um, I have a dog, Rocco, who likes to star in many of my video conferences, so you may hear him. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. And the reason why we have uh, what our favorite animal is, is we'd, we'd like you to um, uh, you know, to use the interactive polling and, uh, and please share what your favorite animal is uh, because, you know, we think animals are cool and uh, it would be great if you could just share that with all of us. So for now, um, Nicole is going to uh, take us through uh, what a clinical trial is um, and, uh, you know, she'll, um, you know, give us a run through. All right, so I'm really excited to share with you about clinical trials, and I wonder if any of you already know a little bit about clinical trials, um, or maybe you've been in a clinical trial, so that would be interesting to hear about. So a clinical study, which you would also hear referred to as a clinical research trial, is very carefully controlled scientific investigation. And it can help us answer a lot of different questions about a study drug. Two of the main questions that we're trying to answer whenever we have a study is, is it safe? And then second, does it work? When you take part in the research study, um, which like we said, I've taken part in one, so has Liz, um, it's different than your regular medical care. So instead of going to your family doctor, for instance, when you're in a study, you'll primarily interact with your study team. And that team has a doctor for the study, it has nurses, and it also has a lot of other people that help support that study with the study doctor. Um, and when, they're when you're going through that process, they're looking at um, researching the study drug to see if it's F efficacious or its efficacy, and then also if it's safe. So if it works and if it's safe, those are two of the main things that they're looking at. And when you, in order to do that, some of the participants are given the study drug, and then others are given what would be called standard of care, maybe what, already, what they're already on, or what's already normal to treat that condition, or a placebo which would be no ingredient. You could think of it as a sugar pill or a pill that looks just like the other one, but without the active ingredient. Um, and something that you guys might be really interested to know is that the medicines that you see today, every modern prescription medicine that we have today was studied in hundreds or often in thousands of people. So none of those medications would be available without the clinical research process. Next slide. Apologies. Thanks, Nicole. I think we're moving on to sharing our stories and I'm first up, so thank you. And I'm really happy to be here today with ICANN and all of you to share with you my experience. Like many of you, I too am a patient I became a patient in 2016 when I was diagnosed with advanced ovarian cancer. 
Ovarian cancer is a rare cancer and impacts about 1% of women. And in the US, about 22,000 women will be diagnosed in 2020 with ovarian cancer. At the time of my diagnosis, um, my oncologist shared the standard of care as well as a clinical trial that was non-Pfizer sponsored uh, that he highly um, suggested I should consider and enroll in. After considerable thought and consideration, considering I know how much goes into clinical trials, um, I decided to participate. Um, as you know, it was clear to me um, that the treatments for ovarian cancer have not progressed much over the past 30 years. Um, there's not been a lot of new um, treatments available to women with ovarian cancer. So I decided I should participate. My trial uh, was included drug with the standard of care. So I was on a PARP inhibitor um, in conjunction with the standard of care traditional chemotherapy um, for uh, four months or 18 cycles of chemo. After that, I moved into what was called the maintenance uh, portion of it. And this is where you could either be on placebo or um, study drug. And I was um, on the maintenance portion of the study for 18 months. And at the end of the 18 months, when I was finished, you know, I had many questions. I said, you know, when will I see my study data? When will I see, you know, was I on drug or not on drug? And uh, but my, my doctor, unfortunately, was like, I don't know. I'm not sure yet. Don't, don't know when the study results will be available. Um, and that was it. And I said, well, you know, what next? And they were like, well, now you'll go to standard maintenance care, which was we'll see you in three months. Bye. <laughs> So it was a little lackluster. Um, and that is when I became really happy to participate on improving our clinical trial experiences. And, you know, Pfizer has spent a tremendous amount of time and energy to really understand and improve our, the clinical trial experience for patients, sites, which includes our investigators, the study coordinators, the nurses, um, as well as for our advocacy groups. Um, so I was more than happy to participate on um, the initiative that David will share with you um, later in this presentation about what we're doing to make participants and, and our sites feel um, appreciated and acknowledge the, what they've done to help progress moving medicines forward. So it's really been a privilege and an honor to be able to share my experience here with you today, as well as, um, you know, I'm a fairly new patient and, you know, I, I hear all of you and you're, you're really role models for me um, as I, I continue to navigate my health journey. So I really do appreciate your time and thanks for letting me share my story with you. Thanks, Liz. So now I'm going to take you through my um, experience with the clinical trial, which led to what I do today. Um, and I'm also just very excited to be here with you. And like I mentioned, um, I'm wearing the rare disease t-shirt because I was diagnosed with a rare disease. Um, so feel free to pop in the chat if any of you wanted to share if, if you're in the rare disease club. I know that rare diseases affect a lot of pediatrics, so I figure there's a lot of you out there today. So my rare disease is called cystic fibrosis, and I wondered uh, if anyone knows what cystic fibrosis is. It's a long jumbly name, and a lot of times they teach kids the name of their disease by teaching them the word 65 roses. So it sounds very similar. Um, so if anyone knows what CF is or thinks they know what CF is, take a guess, pop it in the chat. So just to kind of give you a uh, background on what it is, it's a genetic disease, and it causes a really thick, sticky buildup of mucus in your lungs. 
and your pancreas and your other organs. And so most people associate it with lung disease, but it actually affects your whole body. And then over time, all of that damages your lungs. It causes severe breathing problems. So if you've ever been really sick with bronchitis or pneumonia, you can kind of think of it like having that every day. Um, so I'm going to take you through what my life was like when I was your age, because I actually wasn't diagnosed with my rare disease until I was 21. And that's very uncommon for this disease. Um, so I didn't know until sixth grade the term cystic fibrosis. And I remembered the name that the people in the laboratory told me they were testing me for. And you might not believe this, but we didn't have cell phones or Google then. So I just remembered the name. And when I went back to my classroom, I looked up the word in an encyclopedia. Does anybody know what an encyclopedia is? It's a really big book. And they used to sit up on the shelf in big lines. And so I went to the section with the C's and I looked up cystic fibrosis. And I learned that it said if I had this disease, I wouldn't live to see my 18th birthday, most likely. Um, and so obviously I'm here with you today. So a lot of things have changed. And the trial that I participated in was one of those things that helped to change a lot of people's lives. So when I was finally diagnosed at 21, all of the advancements that science had made helped people with cystic fibrosis live a lot longer. So at that point, people were living into their early 30s. Um, and so when I was first diagnosed at 21 and then until I was 31, I did all of the regular medications that they used and all the therapies they used for cystic fibrosis. So that's called your standard of care. And we mentioned that earlier in the presentation. Standard of care for CF is a lot of stuff. It's about 100 minutes a day. Um, so most patients spend between an hour and an hour and a half, and it includes multiple medications, nebulizers, which if you're not familiar with a nebulizer is a machine that pushes out air and you connect a cup of medicine to it and you put it in your mouth and you, you breathe it in and it helps um, open up your lungs or thin the mucus or kill the bacteria that are in there. We also have to do chest physical therapy twice a day, and that's to help clear out that mucus allergy shots. Uh, I took injectable medications twice a month and lots and lots and lots of pills. And the reason why I'm telling you about that is because I want to show you how that changed compared to where I'm at today, thanks to my trial. And so now we're going to pause for just a minute and we're going to watch a video on a, a little story I did about my trial. So while they're getting that video up, feel free to pop into the chat and let us know if you've been in a trial or if you have any interesting questions about trials. My name is Nicole Horvath. I'm located in Kalamazoo, Michigan at our PGS site. I am a senior regulatory specialist and I handle CMC change management. My husband and I have been married for 14 years. We have four very energetic and beautiful children. I wasn't diagnosed with cystic fibrosis until I was 21 years of age, but I think my earliest memories of really realizing there was something wrong would be in elementary school. Once I was diagnosed, I started on the standard CF care regimen and medications. Um, cystic fibrosis has one of the highest treatment burdens of any of the diseases out there that you manage chronically. So I learned about the clinical trial from a friend in the CF community. I had met another um, father of a patient who had been recently diagnosed and he sought me out because he saw that I had the same rare mutation that his daughter had. I think the CF community is very tight knit. So I felt like I wanted to help those who were essentially younger than me or coming behind me. And also um, as a scientist, you know, I just really admire and respect the scientific process, the clinical process. The trial had me traveling from Michigan to Colorado 
which was quite a geographic juggling act because I traveled once to three times a month depending on the leg of the trial that I was in. What I didn't realize is that it truly was like a roller coaster. The first few days that you were on medication, um, you had a lot of coffee and a lot of fatigue. It was essentially clearing out a lifetime worth of gunk in your lungs. And then coming off of the medication, the onset of fatigue and swelling, inflammation, and the return back to cough was what I can best describe to you as coming down with pneumonia each time. I don't have any regrets about participating in the trial. Um, I think it was an amazing experience and because I was participating in the trial, they were able to use my patient data and submit that. So earlier this year, my mutation as well as the 22 other people's mutations that were represented in the study actually were approved for use for the drug. So everyone with essentially, you know, my ultra orphan mutation is now able to get the prescription, you know, on label. All right, so one of the things in my trial um, is that they were testing out a lot of different things. And so we talked about how they test out safety and efficacy on whether it works and whether it's safe for the patients. Um, they always are testing a lot of other things. So I thought I would mention some things in my trial that were unique and different um, that you guys might be interested in. So the first is that my trial, the medication was already approved for use in cystic fibrosis, but only for a few patients. And they knew it worked for that group. And so they were trying to see if it would help all of these other people. So they had already tested out and proved that it was safe. So that was great news. The second part is they were gonna see if it worked for more people. So we knew it worked for a small set and we were trying to expand it so that more people could get benefit from this medicine. They were also trying to see for those of us that it worked for, how quickly did it work? And so we did multiple things. Um, for instance, the first time that I was on the drug, which I didn't know I was on it, I was on it for two weeks um, and then I was my own control. And so that means they looked at how I, how my health was when I was on the drug and when I was off the drug. So in one section, I would be on it for two weeks and in another section, I would be off it for two weeks. And then they wanted to see, could they tell that I was on it in that two weeks? Of course, I didn't know if I was on it or off. Um, and then during another phase of the trial, I was on it for four weeks. And then there was a section where I was off it for four weeks and they could see um, the health numbers that they were comparing during those two things. One of the other interesting things is that they were testing out different types of technologies. And I have kids and teenagers at home. So I know you guys are really interested in that. So I thought I would mention um, that in addition to traveling all the way to Denver, I also had a lot of things that I wore and did when I was at home too. So each day I would wear a special type of activity and sleep tracker, and they weren't as common then as they are now, but you guys might have Fitbits and Apple watches and all of those things. So I wore one that I would clip on my clothes and it was connected to an iPhone that they sent me home with. And each day I would log into that iPhone and I would fill out an electric diary and a questionnaire and I would submit that on the phone and it would go to the study team. And then I would connect a piece of technology to my iPhone, it's called a spirometer. And a spirometer measures your lung function, how well you're breathing, how much you can breathe in, how much you can breathe out. And so I would do that three times and then it would take the best number that I got and I would submit that data through the phone as well to my care center that was doing the study. And so um, I also had, of course, to remember to take my tablets twice a day. And one of the things that was interesting that I learned in the study that I didn't know they could do is they sent me home with very special tablets that I had to take twice a day. And when I would punch them out of the foil, the foil actually had lines in it and it recorded the time and date that I punched those out. That way they knew if I was taking my medicine on time because I had to take it at very specific times during the day. So I thought that was really cool. Um, and then when I would go into the um, trial center, they would do additional tests. Um, and so what that looked for me 
like for me, of course, was all the normal lab blood work, um, a sweat test, which if you're familiar with cystic fibrosis, you might know that we have more salt in our sweat than most people, because that's part of what's wrong with our body. And so they would measure to see if that was changing over time by actually collecting some of my sweat. Um, I would also do the spirometer, but a much bigger, fancier one than I had at home. And then one of the reasons that I had to travel back and forth to Denver was to do a really, really specialized lung test. I would breathe some things in and then they would measure how long it took for all of that to be out of my lungs. It was very safe. Um, but that special piece of machine machinery was only in two places in the whole country at that time and Denver was one of them. So that's why I would travel back and forth. So I was curious if anybody else uses devices to help them manage their disease or maybe as a part of a trial or a treatment or a therapy. I still have a home spirometer to measure my lung function that I use today if I'm feeling sick to see where I'm at. Um, and there's a lot of interesting ways I think that technology can help us. So that was something I was curious about. Do you guys use any technology? All right, so what I really wanna share with you today and why I do what I do is because when I was done with the trial, I was able to stay on the medication that I was in the trial for. And that will be seven years ago in September. So if you remember, I said one to one and a half hours a day for our treatments. Today, I take those two tablets twice a day and I don't do anything else. So I don't do any nebulizers. I don't do any chest physical therapy. This isn't possible for everyone with my disease, but it is possible for me because in those seven years of being able to eliminate all the other standard of care treatment items that we talked about, I've had no pneumonia, I've had no hospitalizations, and I've had no antibiotics. And that was two to four times a year for me every year before the trial. So it really, really changed my life, which was the high point of the trial. Not only changed my life, but I've heard from other people that have the same mutation or type of CF that I have, and they're able to be on the medication now because I was in the trial. So that was definitely the high point for me. And the low point was very similar to Liz's in that some of my experiences included things that were not um, friendly or good for patients. And it's not because they meant to. The study team and the nurses were amazing. I love them so much. It's just because they didn't think like a patient and or the trial was set up in a way that didn't consider the patient's point of view. And they didn't realize some of the decisions that they were making, the impact that that had on me. So if you'd like to go into the chat, feel free to share your high or low or anything that you want from your personal story. But you don't need to share. That's up to you. Um, so on the slide that we started with, it's why we did what we do. And, and this is why, because coming out of the trial, I realized just how fortunate I was and I wanted to find a way to give back and help other patients to have that big change in their life, but also if they're going through something to make that easier. So I like to take what I consider to be my professional experience here at work that I've worked at Pfizer, you know, for 17 years now, and my professional experience on the other hand as a patient. And I kind of like to act like a bridge so that I'm bringing the two groups together closer and closer and helping to share with both sides the other's point of view. I kind of talk, um, I, I kind of say that I talk both languages, right? Because I talk patient and then I talk the medical and the pharma and the clinical trials. So I'm, I'm really, really excited that I got to speak with you today and to share my story. And I'm really um, interested in the ICANN organization and how they empower you guys and let you know that your opinion and your experiences are valuable because it actually took me a really long time to realize that. Um, and I think it's easy for those of you and myself walking this path to overlook the impact that sharing our stories can have for others, especially if you think that the adults aren't listening or that they don't get it. And so David and Nicola are gonna talk next and you'll see from them and the questions that we have prepared for you, just how much we value your opinion and your experience. And so today I'm gonna to close out my talk with a quote that I really love. And it was Oprah that I originally heard say it. 
And she said, speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. So thank you for allowing you to speak allowing me to speak my truth to you today. And I hope that we'll hear more from you and really be able to learn from you the rest of the presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so again, um, hello everyone and, and, and welcome to our session. Um, as I said, when we started uh, uh, talking, I'm gonna talk to you guys about uh, uh, pediatric uh, gene therapy. And before I get into that, I, I also wanted to share that uh, um, I'm a survivor of a rare pediatric cancer. Uh, and I strongly believe that having gone through that challenge and experience set me on a path to where I am today. And as you can imagine, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to uh, 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 be in charge of engaging with patients and patient advocacy organizations around clinical trials, which um, you know I've been through uh, myself. Um, so, if we can go to the next slide, uh, basically I will just want to make sure that everybody on the line understand what uh, you know. What is a gene? What is gene therapy? And why we're we talking about that today? Um, some of you may know that genes are basically little portions of, of something that we call DNA, which is in our cells. And, and, and genes contain basically information like a blueprint or a manual uh, in order for cells to make uh, uh, little molecules that we call protein. And then protein in turn are able to do a whole bunch of different things in our body to make sure that uh, all of the functions uh, are working well. Now, sometimes what can happen is you may have heard the term genetic mutation or genetic alteration, which happens at the level of a gene and can cause a genetic disease in which a protein is either not going to be made or not going to be functioning properly. Uh, so, so why am I telling you this? There are 7, 000, about 7,000 known rare diseases in the world and 80% of them, which is the vast majority, have a genetic origin, which means that those diseases are caused by a genetic mutation that then makes our body either unable to make a certain protein or to make a protein that is not going to work. Now, with gene therapy, which is a new technology that we use to try and treat people with a, with a genetic disease, um, we hope to potentially uh, transform the life of those patients by restoring that function that wasn't working. And what gene therapy does is, you know, to make a long story short, it basically delivers a, a gene or a version of that gene um, targeted to where the protein is going to be made uh, and it hopefully addressing that, you know, underlying cause of the disease. So we have a little video uh, two plates, not very long, it's two minutes and a half, and it's going to explain to you guys in a very visual manner uh, what I just did in a much better way, obviously. Okay, so if we can play the video. Today, Pfizer Rare Disease is working on new transformative approaches to treat genetic diseases. Our genes play an essential role in determining the function of each cell in the body and are made up of 30 million codes of DNA. If even one of these codes is damaged, a genetic alteration may occur, causing genetic diseases, some of which can be debilitating and life-threatening. Pfizer researchers are working to target the underlying causes of certain genetic diseases by focusing on highly specialized, potentially one-time gene therapies using AAV vectors. This type of in vivo gene therapy has the potential to directly target cells with consistent treatment. It is a technology that can be standardized streamlining the manufacturing and regulatory path to medicine approval. Vectors are modeled after AAV, or adeno-associated virus, in which most of the viral genes are removed and replaced with a functioning therapeutic gene. AAV vectors are custom-made empty capsules used to potentially deliver treatment directly to the targeted cells through an infusion into the body. Gene therapy is designed to target specific organs, such as the liver, other organs are also being studied as potential gene therapy targets. 
When the vector reaches its target cell, the functioning gene is transferred and used as a blueprint to create the missing or non-functioning protein. The goal is to restore normal function in affected tissues or cells. This could potentially enable a patient to manage his or her disease without the need for ongoing treatments. While the potential of gene therapy is exciting, there are still many unknowns. Clinical trials are underway to explore the potential of gene therapy, including how to identify patients, effectiveness, safety, and duration of response, and the impact of immune responses. There are more than 7,000 known rare diseases worldwide. Of these, 80% or nearly 6,000 are genetic in origin. As we unlock the potential of using genes as medicine to make a meaningful difference in the lives of patients, it has become clear genetics may not have to determine the future of a person living with rare disease. If successful, imagine the possibilities. Thank you. So I hope that the video was able to convey to you a little bit, at least in principle, what are genes, what is a genetic disease, and then what gene therapy uh, can potentially do for patients. So now I want to move a little bit away from the science, and I want to talk about the experience, the experience as a patient, the experience as a patient in a clinical trials, and more specifically in a gene therapy trial. When I'm thinking back to my own experience as a patient going through a clinical trial, back in the 90s, I was a teenager, and now as an adult, I don't really have anything left from that era. I don't have a keepsake. I don't have souvenirs. And, and to me, it's always been almost like, you know, a missed opportunity because I would like to have something, right? Um, at least that's how I feel. But today I want to talk to you guys and see how, how you guys feel about it. So the concept I want to discuss would be to put together a pediatric gene therapy separation program. And, and why would I want to do that? One specific particularity about gene therapy treatment is that it, it's, it's you know, potentially one injection. You receive the gene therapy on a very particular day and then, and then you have it. And then hopefully it can transform you know, your, your, your path uh, behind that. And so the way I looked at it was, you know, it should be celebrated, not just with a mark on the calendar, but how can we make this a memorable experience a memorable day, but also demonstrate our gratitude towards those patients who volunteer to be in our trials that are so important, as my colleague just explained to you guys. Um, but obviously, we want to make sure that we do this right, and, and we want to make sure that it even makes sense to begin with. Uh, and so one of the first, you know, poll question that I had for you guys, and, and feel free to, to answer in the, in the poll chat, is you know, is this actually true? Do you guys think that this is something that we would want actually to, to celebrate when, when a, a child in a gene therapy clinical trial receives that injection, should we make a big deal out of it, right? And, and if yes, how much of a big deal? Should this be celebrated in a big way, similar to a birthday or a graduation? And we'll get into a bit more details after that. Um, should we maybe do something not as big, maybe, you know, just a little something like the first day of school, for example? Um, should we keep it very minimal? Uh, uh, so still, you know, recognize that it's an important day, but not, not go too far? Or should we do nothing at all? And, and you know, it's, it's also easy to maybe understand that, you know, some participants, some, some kids would rather just this be discreet and not make a big deal out of it. Um, probably a personal choice, but definitely looking forward to having uh, your opinion about this, guys. So if you could at least, you know, select one of these choices, um, that would be very, very helpful for us to understand. Uh, maybe we can move on to the next slide. Um, so now thinking about, you know, a celebration usually goes hand in hand with some sort of a keepsake, right? Again, a way to demonstrate our gratitude, but also uh, for something to keep and to remember on, you know, later on in, in life. Um, but what could this be, right? Uh, uh, and again, if, if um, you guys could select, you know, that one thing that you think would be most um, desirable, but also appropriate and make sense, um, 
should it or could it be a certificate, a medal, a badge, a ring, like a Super Bowl ring, a cup, um, maybe, you know, something not physical, like a star in the galaxy named after you guys. Um, you know, obviously tattoo here, but whether that, I mean a temporary tattoo uh, uh, or, or nothing at all. And maybe, you know, something else, but in which case, you know, none of these are dear are great. Um, again, if, if uh, uh, you guys could uh, pick one of these choices, that would help us sort of get an idea of, of where uh, we should go. Um, if we go on the next slide, um, now beyond the keepsake, I want to talk a little bit more about the, ex the experience. Um, yes, thank you. So two things. Um, it, I think it'd be fun to give it a theme, right? Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of ideas out there and here I've listed a couple of themes and I'd be very curious to know um, if one of those themes would sort of resonate with you guys or not, or maybe, you know, maybe you should pick something else. So the first theme that came to me in mind uh, was the superhero uh, because, you know, basically the day that a patient receives gene therapy, their genetic code is altered hopefully for the better, right? And so that kind of gave us the, the thinking of, it's almost like gaining a superpower, right? Because all of a sudden you get that gene that's gonna help your cells and your body cope better with a disease. And so that's how you, you, we came with the, the theme of maybe the superhero um, or maybe the, the theme about, about science, right? Cause it is, you know, enabled through, through science and innovation. So something uh, along the lines of, an, of a Nobel prize Courage was also important because, again, right, you have to uh, to volunteer and participate uh, to a clinical trial that has a lot of unknowns and and also has its own set of inherent risks. Uh, and so, courage could also be a theme, like a, like a military medals, or maybe none of those themes resonate with you, and we completely miss the mark. And in which case, you can select the the choice number four. Um, so. Um, Trying to dig a little deeper into the experience part of that, um, you know, it, it wouldn't be a great celebration or party without sort of all of the ingredients and making into a little happening. And with the examples that I've talked about before, you know, birthday, uh, graduation, celebration, winning a, a sports tournament, you know, you have those ingredients, right? So uh, for each of those, you don't have to select one, right? Because it takes many ingredients to make a great happening, a great party. Uh, but for each of those, if you can say whether you think it's a good idea or whether you think it's not such a great idea, so yes or no for each of those. So taking pictures, you know, that's, the, that's actually the one thing that I don't have from back when I was a patient that I really wish I had uh, are just, you know, simple pictures, right, of me with my friends, with my families, with my nurses, with my doctors. I, I you know, I wish I had pictures from back then. Um, you know, is it really a party if there's no cake? I'm not sure. I don't want to bias you guys, but, uh, you know, you, you guys tell us if, if maybe a, a cake could be a good idea. Uh, and then we, you know, let's go nuts. Should it, you know, should it be a costume day? Should we put on banners? Should someone record a film like, like you see sometimes in weddings that you can watch, you know, afterwards or a signature book, right? Where people would, you know, put a little message and they, they were with you either physically or in thoughts on that day that you received the gene therapy. So these are all ideas. And for each of those, if you could let us know if it's a good idea or not a great idea, uh, please let us know. And, you know, we don't know, you know, what it's going to look like or when and if we'll be able to implement things like that. But your feedback is going to be incredibly helpful in trying to make this happen. And um, I want to thank you guys for taking part in that in that poll. And I think I will pass the baton to you, David. Thank you, Nicola. All right. Um, so we're, we're we're getting short on time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go quickly through some of my stuff. But I wanted to share this slide. And and someone had posted in the chat um, about uh, privacy, uh, patient privacy. Um, and you know, just really quickly, because we're all sharing sharing stories about clinical trials. Um, this is an individual, this, this patient, 1001-1202, um, who is suffering from stage three metastatic melanoma, was in a Pfizer clinical trial um, for a new immunotherapy drug. Um, and in 2004, you can see they had had radical surgery. 
and the melanoma was spreading um, was spreading certainly across their face, but it was uh, spreading in other parts of their body. And as participating in this clinical trial in February of 2007, um, you can see that this individual um, had uh, a complete response uh, after 33 months of uh, of treatment. Uh, on this, so we don't we don't um, we don't identify individuals who participate uh, in clinical trials, and uh, this this individual had a patient number. But if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, this particular patient, um, this particular patient uh, is my dad. Um, so um, you know, I, I I I am sharing his identity, but um, you know, it did. Put my feet on a path around uh, around work around sharing results of clinical trials, and one of the things that um, my dad never actually found out the result of the clinical trial, but you know he was um, he he uh, he went into remission after um, after being treated in the trial. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, sharing results with participants is really important, um, and I just wanted to share uh, this picture of the two of us with you. Next slide, please. But I think this gets into the overall story about what it is we're trying to do around uh, thoughtful closure. We want to make sure that every clinical trial participant and anyone who's working with Pfizer on clinical trials feels a sense of accomplishment and that uh, they've made a meaningful contribution to, to clinical research. And, uh, you know, this whole initiative is really around accomplishing that. Um, and, you know, we have a, a personal goal, you know, as a company to become the most patient centric company in the industry. And if we simply can't say thank you and share results with, with people, I mean, I think that's the bare minimum that we can be doing. So everyone who's presented today really believes in what we're doing here. Next slide, please. Um, I'm probably going to skip this, but the, the the only thing to say is that um, a lot of people have been asked about what is most important to them, and um, you know the uh, you know I think the things that we see here is that you know 40 percent or 39 percent of participants never heard back after the trial. Um, you know this was all from a from a survey that was done with uh, the Center for the Information uh, and Study of Clinical Research participants. Um, 61 of those participants never received reports or updates around the results of the study. Um, and 68% of participants are interested in study results, but they never actually find out. And then there's an article that was published in Nature about how a simple thank you can really improve uh, clinical trials. And we have a quote from a patient. They want to know that, you know, they're not wasting their time. They want to know that it's helping. And, and, uh, and if we don't give them feedback, then they never know how that feels. So next slide, please. So our thoughtful closure program focuses on the participants, on the site and their staff, and patient advocacy organizations like ICANN. And uh, our intention is is to share uh, meaningful updates and thank uh, and thanks with each of these uh, with, with each of these stakeholders. Next slide, please. And uh, on this slide, we, you know, give you an example of the, of the, the two components uh, is one around uh, gratitude and one around closing the loop. And here you can see some examples of the heart and the flower and the kind of branding that we're doing uh, around, uh, around our program. So one is a, a simple thank you card that we send to participants. And the other is a cover page to a, uh, a summary of the results. And we personalize it for the individual so that they know that they were one of 391 participants, that it took 14 months to do the study, 106 sites across the 13 countries, to give a sense of scale of the work that's been done. Next slide, please. On this slide, we, uh, this upcoming slide, we have a nice example of our thank you cards. Um, and if you notice, uh, all of the imagery that we've got is utilizing the, uh, the Pfizer ellipse, our, our logo, but in a stylized way that, uh, that sends a message. So this one is our, our heart, and we say thank you for being at the heart of research. And we have a personalized message and signatures from the clinical team. Next slide, please. 
and we have different branding for different uh, for different programs. So we, you know, all the images were done using the Pfizer logo. Uh, we have the butterfly, we have the flower, and we have the heart. Um, and we choose the image based on the kind of indication, the audience, and the age of the participant. Next, next slide, please. Which gets us now to what we want to do with all of you. So, you know, part of what we're doing is not only are we doing, we're not just doing thank you cards for, for grownups, we're doing thank you cards for kids and we need your input. So we've started, um, we started designing a series of pediatric designs, which we would love to know what are your favorites and what are your least favorites. And so here, here are some of the ones we've got. Which are the ones do you like the best? And the poll is going to come up. Um, so we have one with balloons, we have one with a bunny, and we have one with a rocket for, um, for our, our younger clinical trial participants. And if you can vote, tell us which ones you like best and which ones you like least. Okay. And then on our, uh, our next slide, we have um, for some of our older kids, um, which design do you like the best? We have one that's around music, uh, one with a, a camera for taking pictures, uh, one is a video game controller, and one is a, a campfire. Which one do you like the best and which one do you like the least? And we really do appreciate your input because we're going to make a decision about what, uh, what branding we're going to use on our thank you cards. And it's going to be based on the input that you've given us today. So this is a big decision, but we're really excited because um, we don't think that we as, as grownups should be making the choice. We would love to, we would love to hear from kids uh, which ones they like the best. All right. I think that takes us to the end of um, the end of our session today. Um, if, yeah, and, and again, so the theme of all of this is is thank you, and I do want to thank uh, all of you. I want to thank I can, and I want to thank all of our presenters today. Um, it was really meaningful for us to come and to speak with you all. And um, again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll be happy to answer any of those uh, as the conference progresses. Any, anything else from our panelists? Would anyone else like to say anything? Otherwise, uh, I'll, I'll sign off. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone, again, from all of us. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thanks, David. It was a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, everybody.